looking at the technological advances. I used to be on dial up looking for. Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. This is your host, Mongo Slade. So today we're going to talk about the devaluation of an art form. So um, in my previous video, I talked about how, you know, wrestling, WWE, because that's, that's what everybody cares about, has been following in behind Hollywood. And it's been a negative thing in terms of the Hollywood aesthetic, as far as physical, you know, how men look, masculinity, those types of things. Today, we're going to talk from, from a different, we're going to talk about that same subject from a different perspective. We're going to talk about how wrestling used to be a unique art form and now has been almost consistently devalued to the point of just being generic entertainment or generic content. And this has been going on for a long time. And if you listen to any of the WWE investment meetings, you hear the words content and the words entertainment almost routinely. You almost never hear the word wrestling, right? And the people have a, definitely have a problem with that. And there's been a lot of people who have been sounding the horn about this. But what I found is that if you read what Martin Scorsese has said about like the Marvel movies and what different film critics have been talking about in terms of what's going on to the movie industry, you can see that it's been going on with WWE also for a long time, just replaced the term cinema or film with wrestling, right? So this is what Martin Scorsese had to say about the change in movies and the change in film over the last several decades. He says, the art of cinema is being systematically devalued, sidelined, demeaned, and reduced to its lowest common denominator, quote unquote, content. As recently as 15 years ago, the term content was only when people were discussing the cinema on a serious level, and it was contrasted with and measured against form. Then, gradually, it was used more and more by the people who took over the media companies, most of whom knew nothing about the history of the art form or even cared enough to think that they should. Content became a business term for all moving images, a David Lean movie, a cat video, a Super Bowl commercial, a superhero sequel, a series episode. It was linked, of course, not to the theatrical experience, but to home viewing on the streaming platforms that have come to overtake the movie going experience. Just as Amazon took, overtook physical stores. So when you, he's talking about the viewing experience, right? The, that cinema is all about the viewing experience. Wrestling is also about the viewing experience, but you have looked at wrestling, especially nowadays, wrestling has completely about, uh, quote unquote content, quote unquote entertainment. And these things are very nebulous. Nobody knows what these things mean. They're very, uh, they're blob terms. Wrestling is specific. What is wrestling? Wrestling is a very specific thing. Now, when he talks about uh, the theatrical experience, right? You can, you can change that, take that out and put the live audience for a wrestling experience, right? When you go back to what wrestling used to be when wrestling was fun, back then people... Inter interacted with the audience. Like, I want to mention something that I, that I haven't noticed in a long time. Have you noticed that the wrestlers, you know, come down the aisle and they would touch the hands of every fan that they walk by that very few wrestlers do that nowadays. Very few wrestlers actually come into contact with the audience. You know, I'm not just mean just, you know, Oh, it's a pandemic. Everybody's sick. No, I mean, even before that, even before that, how many people really got out there and was in contact with the audience? Very few. If you go back a couple of decades, go to Mid South, go to World Class Championship Wrestling, you would be, there were very few barriers between the audience and the wrestler. And the wrestler almost always talked to the audience. When they talked, when they called the bad guy a coward or something like that. He was talking to the audience, not to the hard cam, not to the people at home. When they were talking to the people at home, right, it was almost always separate from what they were doing. When they were in front of the audience, they played to the audience. When they weren't in front of the audience, they played to the camera, right? But that's been changed. And it's, it's obviously a WWE doing. But when you go back and you watch like the binaries come through the crowd, there's like a little rope between them and the audience and they would touch every hand that they could. 
They would grab hugs. People would grab hugs on them. They kiss some of the girls. Sometimes the girls would kiss them. They take gifts. They take flowers from the audience. That that kind of stuff. Mid South, you would see the same thing. Guys would go around. The ring is right here, you know, right in the center of the shot. They would go around the ring to touch the hands of everybody in the audience. And they would accept gifts. They would accept hugs. And then they'd get in the ring, right? They don't do that stuff anymore. Now it's just you go down the ramp. You do your little taunt. You go up the steps. You do your little taunt again. And then you get in the ring. You don't even acknowledge that there are people around the, around the ring in some cases. In some cases, you don't even acknowledge that there's people there. So is, all right, so are you surprised that the viewing experience, the live experience is not the same as it used to be? And so people don't go. Are you is that a big surprise anymore? You no longer feel jealous that you weren't there. I'll give you another example. WWE specifically used to do dark matches after pay-per-views. There would be a pay-per-view dark match. Right. One of the most famous is the Undertaker Gold Dust Casket match. I believe that took place after, I want to say, Mind Games. Right. There used to be dark matches before the show and then dark matches after the show. You were playing to the people in the building. Sure, the pay-per-view was going to be streamed all over the country, all over the globe. Sure. But there was people in the building and we wanted those people happy. We wanted to keep those people excited. We wanted those people to do something. We want to punish the people who did not come to the show. Right. So we will interact with the audience who was there. If the camera catches it, good. If the camera doesn't catch it, too bad. But when you go back and you watch a lot of these small town, um, when I watched GCW, that one time I watched it, it felt a lot like the old timey wrestling where you had Nick Gage come out and he swarmed by these people and there he's pushing them and they pushing him and you know, they're slapping hands and everything. When you see like those indie shows and that's how the, the energy is, there's no, there's no huge barriers in between them. No tons of security. The wrestler can get in contact with the audience. The audience can get in contact with the wrestler. That is a completely different experience. That's what wrestling used to be, you know? And I don't, and I don't mean that that's kind of how it needs to be. What I'm saying is there needs to be some type of interaction between the person in the ring and the person outside the ring. Because, you know, hey, when the guy takes off his shirt and he throws it into the crowd, that shouldn't be the only time he interacts with the crowd. He should be interacting with the crowd all the time from the moment he comes out to the moment he goes back. Play to the crowd. Now they're playing to the camera. And that is making wrestling a generic entertainment, generic content. And that's when, you know, you don't have to have a specific match do a specific story time storyline anymore. It just has to be something you throw up on YouTube or throw up on Twitter. You know, this is where we get the, the zombies, you know, because now we can do zombies and we can do fireworks because it's all content. It doesn't mean that it's wrestling. It just means that it's content. It's something that we produced that we can now put up on Twitter, put up on YouTube, show to somebody and say, hey, look at what we look at what we made. It's not wrestling, though. And so let's let's go through this again, because there's another guy who talks about this. Uh, I don't remember what his name is, but he's writing for Roger Ebert dot net, I believe, or dot was it dot dot com. OK, so he says the content label has swarmed in and continues to assimilate every art form. Increasingly, media outlets that used to distinguish between the two have shown signs of surrendering the inevitable. The founder of this site, Roger Ebert, started running articles about TV in the final years of his life. RogerEbert.com now has a thriving television section and reviews two-hour movies made for streaming services like Netflix and other platforms of varying budget levels. My other regular outlet, the New York Magazine, and its arts website, Vulture, brokered a peace agreement between the TV and film sections, which were having miniature turf wars who should review movies that went directly to TV and streaming platforms, as well as epic nonfiction like OJ's Made in America that were financed by as TV programs, but tried to game the system to get film awards by screening in their rarity in a handful of cinemas. Now the rule is that with some exceptions, anything that's a standalone feature gets reviewed by the movie critics. That's it. See, that's very interesting. They're not making a distinction between TV and film anymore. 
and the, the the channel that I was looking at, they were talking about how, you know, the bleed over between movies and TV is becoming so much the same. And the Marvel movies became sort of patient zero because like a TV show, you would get a hour and a half movie and then you have to wait for the next movie in order to get the finish of the story, right? You get a complete story within Iron Man or whatever, right? But it's not over. What's, you know, the end on Iron Man, there's still more. Because now you, you, it's Captain America, and then it's Iron Man again, and then it's this, and then it's that, and then it's this, and then it's that. It's building a TV universe, a shared universe that is now mass producing, not trying to push an, uh, an art form. And when you look at WWE, it does the exact same thing. Each episode of Raw is no longer a, an individual episode of Raw. It's all about trying to push things forward for the big event that's in three weeks or four weeks. And this episode does not matter, right? This is why you can say these shows are interchangeable. That's why it's hard to remember what took place on this Raw because they didn't focus on what was put being put on the screen at this particular moment. They're looking at what's going on in four weeks, you know, the big event, whatever it may be. In some cases, when you talk about WrestleMania, people stop caring about what happens at WrestleMania two months before it. They just want to know who wins the Royal Rumble. Oh, well, he won the Royal Rumble. He's main event in WrestleMania. Therefore, you don't need to watch the show anymore. You don't need to watch the show week to week to know what's going to happen. You might want to watch the card build, but they tell you this guy's going to be in the main event of WrestleMania in January. So that means people are like, okay, well, you know, I can tune out until middle March or whatever. But the mass producing of the show has devalued it. Now it is just content. You know, they produce shit just to produce it now. And I don't just mean that like the commercials, and I'm not saying it's a necessarily a bad thing because it's been very, very profitable for them in doing so, but it's been terrible to the actual wrestling business. You know, because now people are trying to make that turn between being a straight up pro wrestler that comes from some small indie promotion and where you you show up, you wrestle, you go home. Now WWE is trying to turn you into an actor. They're trying to turn you into a comedian. They want you to do commercials. They want you to do media. Go talk to the radio stations. Go talk to these people. Go talk to those people. How to how to interact with the media. Then they want you to dress a certain way to interact with the media. It's a completely different job, and it should make sh it should make sense that certain wrestlers do not do not. Um, conform you know it's just a different level when you talk about a guy like John Moxley right he's one of these artistically minded wrestlers and some of the shit he does is not wrestling because you know he likes to do deathmatch shit but he's an artistically minded wrestler he's not a corporate guy you know that kind of stuff you know getting up at six in the morning to go do media it's not doesn't seem to look like it fits into you know John Moxley's daily program right and it's okay because there still is a place for pro wrestling as it's supposed to be there's still a place for that but it is become quite obvious to me that wwe does not care about obviously they don't care about wrestling that's why they changed it from the world wrestling federation to world wrestling entertainment you know so it's been upwards of 15 years that they've been doing this but it's getting more and more ridiculous to the point where other promotions are doing it. You know, AEW is now doing cinematic matches and they're doing magic and people are disappearing and reappearing. And Impact is doing cinematic matches. People are wrestling themselves. They're disappearing and reappearing. They're all, everyone is creating content. Anybody who's actually doing pro wrestling is very small. New Japan, Ring of Honor, NWA. They have a tough time. Because their content, quote unquote, is wrestling. It is an art form. But WWE and AEW have just decided, fuck it, we're content. We're entertainment. We're going to do sing-alongs and dance segments. And everybody's got a guitar. Everybody's going to rap. Everybody's got to do something else. You can't just be a wrestler. And me as a wrestling critic, I know that. And so when I'm looking at Raw, I understand that. I don't want Raw to be like New Japan. But it could be more like wrestling than it is now. 
You know, so I'm not full of Martin Scorsese or Jim Cornette. It needs to be, this is what it needs to be. It needs to be like Memphis in the 1980s or the 1970s. Like, no. You know, it needs to be, have some of those elements and it needs to have more of those elements. But it can't be that. Not in today's market, not in today's world. So I recognize that these things have changed and that big media companies like NBC, like Netflix and Amazon or whatever, they're not paying for wrestling content. They're paying for the eyeballs of quote unquote content, quote unquote entertainment. That's what they're paying for. Whatever entertains people, whether it's somebody doing a suplex or somebody swallowing a goddamn sword, if they can put it on their streaming service to get people to sit down and spend an hour to watch it or spend money to watch it, that's what they want. And WWE is, is just going to mass produce this shit. Quality be damned. Constantly thinking of the future and not of the art form. Right? Their bottom line. Not of whether the art form is being best served in this way. And that's something to think about. Because that's WWE following Hollywood. Part 2. Thank you guys. And I'll talk to you guys later. Oh, non-aggression. Once that lesson sets in, you'll see a session. But you got an affection for no progression. Regression. The best don't.